If you haven't turned yet, uh, Psalm 130 is where we're at this morning as we continue in our series on the Songs of Ascent. If you'd like a hard copy Bible, raise your hands, or you can just go grab one. Um, Interesting, uh, this past week, my wife's been going through this cycle of sickness with the uh, upper respiratory stuff that's been floating around with everybody that I gave her, and she looked like she was getting better, and then she got hammered again. And so sometimes when you're down and out, what do you do? You know, sometimes maybe you watch some television, and you know, we don't have cable, so we we're looking at these things, and we came across this one episode of this old TV show called Star Trek. Maybe some of you are aware of it. And there's three million different versions of Star Trek, right? And so this is the one with the bald French guy as the captain. And uh, there's an episode where a comedian by the name, real name of Joe Piscopo is a guest star on it as a comedian. And I had never heard of this or seen that. And so we watched that one. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And then just last night, Looking through the news feeds, I see about Joe Piscopo in the news. And I'm going, really? I haven't heard about this guy in forever. Uh, he's a little bit older than I am. Uh, but it was one of those things to where I'm reading in the news how he was from a certain specific uh, political background growing up all his life. But then he left that party because he said that party has basically departed from the things that his dad taught him that were the most important things in life. God family, and faith. And he says, he didn't go to the other side, to the other main, but he says, I definitely tend to align more with them. He says, but I, I, I'm getting all these people because he actually uh, is from New Jersey and almost ran for governor before. But he says, I think I'm going to do it now because there's so few people out there who are championing the cause for the values of God, family, and faith in the political realm anymore. He said, especially from the group that I used to come from. And I thought to myself, here is this guy that for many of us, I mean, he was a Saturday Night Live member back in the day, you know, so often we can kind of put people into boxes, right? For me, he was just another comic. And I remember some of the stuff that he had said before this stand up or change of heart of whatever he's had. And sometimes we forget the fact that people really can change. And so I want to encourage you this morning <laughs> that as we look at a message entitled that God's people place their hope in him, when the world and all that it's throwing at us may rob us of our hope, let's put our hope in Christ. And let's put our hope in the one that was able to change the heart of Saul of Tarsus. He's my absolute go-to when I remember. When I think that the world has no hope, I think of Saul of Tarsus got knocked off his high horse by Jesus himself, <laughs> literally, and converted. And so when there's so much negative and so much evil being portrayed in the world, church, don't lose heart. Put your hope where it needs to be. In the one who loves the world so much that he goes to such great extents to demonstrate that love so that people like Saul of Tarsus and like us, who once did not love him will have that change of heart, have a change of mind, and have a change of eternal address, right? Psalm 130 uh, is extremely special in a sense. So go ahead and stand with me, if you will, and we'll read it, and then we'll get to it. All of Scripture is special, but there's something about this one. I think... Uh, it's just been super used by the Lord over the course of history. Psalm 130, beginning at verse 1. Let's read aloud together. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption. 
and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Father, thank you so much that you are a solid rock, that when we place our hope in you and we keep believing and we keep our hope and our faith and our trust in you, we will never, ever, ever be let down because we I can trust the fact that you are worthy and that you are faithful. And so help us this morning as we hear from your word to grow in our faith, to grow in our hope, to grow in our trust, that we would be more like Christ this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. There's seven psalms that often get grouped together as being referred to as penitential psalms because they're psalms that deal with the reality of sin and the reality of God's forgiveness. This is one of those seven. And people like uh, Martin Luther and John Wesley, Wesley actually credits this specific psalm to being used by God to bring him to saving grace. Luther would find himself often being plagued by demonic spirits, his own words. And it was here that he would come for solace, the 130th Psalm. And so when we look at this Psalm this morning, I pray that there's something that the Spirit brings out to us to help us to see what it is that the Spirit spoke through this Psalmist and why it's so impactful. Verse one, out of the depths. Hmm. Anybody ever felt like you've been in the pit of despair? Anybody ever felt like you've been just so far down? Uh, It's common human experience to be in the depths of despair. And this is why I believe right off the bat, this psalm resonates with people. is because it starts off right right in the beginning where many people find themselves. When is it that you find that your friends and your family members and your co-workers and your co-recreators are most likely to listen to you if you have something to say in the spiritual realm about Jesus. When they're extremely happy, when everything's just going great, when they just won the lottery, does your family want to hear about your Jesus? (laughs) But once despair hits, once the reality of the harshness of life and in the brevity of it hits. Tell you what, that is why we are called to be the light and to share while it's daytime because when it becomes night, you know where they're going to go to for help? Those that in the day were able and willing to actually say something that may have cost them possibly even a friendship or a relationship because when night comes, and it's all dark around, if the light hasn't revealed itself during the daytime, you know where they're going to go? Deeper into the darkness. And don't we see it within our own family members, within our community, within our world? And so this is why I believe right off the bat, this psalm reaches out to people because out of the depths is where so many of us find ourselves. And when we find ourselves in the depths, will we simply look up And I know for many of us, right? And this week, remember, please, on the 20th, right, Ray? I am horrible with this, Ray. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm looking at my watch going, why is it only 9 o'clock? Because I haven't changed my watch yet. I I went to look at the date, and I'm going, oh, it's the 8th. This week on the 13th, Ray's granddaughter, Ivana, will be getting out of, uh, and, and, and she has a whole week before she's going to be going to U-Turn for Christ down in Albuquerque. And that week, she's going to be with Ray. But we all understand that basically U-Turn for Christ is hope for her. It's hope from being set free from the bondage that she's been in for so long. So we understand that the enemy is going to come hitting hard at her, trying to stop her from going. And so on Friday the 13th, please, I mean, Friday the 13th, probably already you remember, right? just because of the, of the day. But from that week of the 13th to the 20th, would you mind making a note on your physical calendars or your actual uh, portable calendars and your phones with you to be praying for Ivana so that she actually will yield to what God wants to do in her life? All right? Because 
she's seriously in the depths of despair right now. And she's been there for a while and she needs the Lord to come through. And she needs to get to that place to where she actually cries out for help. Because we all understand that we've had friends and family members that have been what we thought was so far down that they've got to look up to God now. But for them, it wasn't that far down yet, was it? Sometimes they needed even more. And so we're praying uh, for God's mercy on Ivana. So please be praying with us this week for her. Because out of the depths is where we often find the reality of who God is. And the Psalms are filled with these cries out to God. And I don't know about you, if you've ever got friends or family members who are not believers, giving them a book of Bible promises, I carry those around with me. It's only about, you know, 100 pages. Oftentimes, if, if you can't give them that and you want to give them a Bible, say, just go to the Psalms. Because the Psalms are filled with people crying out to God with real anguish and with real questions and sometimes actually real accusations towards God. Like, hey, are you asleep? Don't you see me? And isn't it interesting that God allowed in his very own word in his love letter to us for that to be there? Because you know what? If you're thinking it, he already knows it. If you're already thinking those things like, God, where are you? Guess what? He's already hearing, even though you haven't directed it to him yet. But once you actually vocalize or even within your mind direct it to him, I believe that's an act of faith. Because you're actually addressing the supreme potentate of the universe, which the world has told us doesn't even exist. And so God says, okay, we can start working now together because you're yielding to me that out of the depths, you're crying to me. The depths of the things of this world that we see in scripture, in this earth, in Psalm 71, uh, we see it about the grave in Psalm 86. Things such as poverty, sorrow, confusion, sickness, pain, these are all listed in scripture of things that people find in the depths. And those are often very good things because that's what God uses to get us to him. And we have to be careful of wanting or believing that God only wants us to be in a state of prosperity and joy all the time. Why? Moses understood it when the children of Israel were about to leave after, what, several centuries of being slaves and now getting their own place that God was going to give them. Listen to what he said to them in Deuteronomy chapter 8. It'll be up on the screen here. Verses 11 14. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God. Wow. If you think about it, when he's saying this to them, what had the children of Israel just experienced? Oh, just Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments, right? They just experienced 10 amazing things. And it wasn't just 10, 10 specific amazing, but all of these things that God did to get them out from freedom, to get them out to freedom from the bondage of, of Egypt. And Moses here already knows, hey, it's only been like two months since we left, guys, but here's my reality, and here's your reality, that we're no longer in bondage. Guess what's probably gonna happen? We're gonna forget. God's gonna give us this amazing land, the land of milk and honey that he promised, and you're going to forget, and you're going to be swayed and seduced into worshiping the gods of the land that God's kicking the people out for us to have. God revealed that to him in his spirit. So he tells him, beware that you don't forget the Lord your God and not keep his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Haven't we kind of seen that within our own nation? That it's at the times of great prosperity that God gets kicked out of the country that he blessed us with? Happens the same way with the people of Israel. And this is the warning for us to understand that, guess what? It's good every now and then for us to have to go through the valley of the shadow of death. Because it's during those times that we are really challenged on what is it that we believe and what have we been placing our faith and our hope in. That's why for me with all this stuff going on right now with the whole coronavirus thing with COVID-19, whatever they want to call it, for me, I'm looking and going, this is awesome. 
it's not awesome that people are dying, so please don't think it's that way for me, because the reality I understand is people are going to die. But when something like this comes and happens, guess what? It shakes up people. Anybody been to a, and I'm sorry about this, anybody been to a funeral lately? Your cousin did such a great job at the funeral, flies in from Spain and del- delivers a message that is timeless. Because guess what? Everybody at the funeral is thinking about what? Not so much the person they came to memorialize. Some of that's there. But the vast majority of people are there thinking about what? I could be next. And that's reality. Because we're all going to die. And when we die, will the people who are there get up one after another and talk about how this person's faith in Christ how this person's faith in Christ and their faith. And you can tell that sometimes people get up and talk about their loved one who had a faith in Christ, but you can tell they don't. And you think to yourself, yes, this is what we all hope to happen at our memorial services, that those closest to us will get up and talk about what they saw and what they heard from us. Whether they believe it or not now, that's between them and the Lord. But the fact is, are we being faithful in the midst of, of our despair, as well as in the midst of our prosperity, to share the light of Christ. But when we find ourselves in that area, will we, like the psalmist says, cry out to him? And in this sense of what the psalmist is writing about, we're going to see exactly what depths he's talking about, the depths of his despair in verse 3. The psalmist is writing here about the fact that he's seeing his sin. He's seeing how great his sin is and how holy his God is and it's taking him so low. And beloved, this really is the point of where conversion happens, is that when we see our sin for what it is in light of the holiness of God, but then we see that that holy God who has every right to pronounce judgment and bring justice upon us is a God who who loves to forgive. Oh my goodness. That's what this is all about. This is the gospel right here. I've cried to you, Lord. Now it's interesting in Psalm 130, and I'm going to point these out for you, um, that you're going to see the word Lord a lot. But if you were to look at the original text, you're going to see two different words here. And I'm going to point that out because I want you to maybe make some notes in your Bible what they are and however you want to do it. So you're going to see either the unpronounceable tetragrammaton, the uh, YHWH or the JHVH, where we get our transliterations for Yahweh and Yehovah, but for a good practicing Jew, it's the unpronounceable title name of God. They would never say it. That's why they leave it as those four letters. But then the other one will be Adonai, and we'll talk about that one a little later. So right here in verse one, right here, I've cried to you, Lord, that's Yahweh. The covenant name of God, most prominently known in connection with his relationship with the nation of Israel. That's where we're looking at at this first one. Never pronounced by a good Jew. But this is who we need to cry to in the midst of all the things that we go through. And what do we cry to him? Verse 2 Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Interesting, right over there in the beginning of verse 2. That Lord, that's no longer Yahweh. That's Adonai. And Adonai is used more of the name that they would actually say, meaning the sovereign master, owner. It's an intimate title that somebody who was a follower of God would say. Yahweh would be that concept that they would think of. He's too holy to approach. But Adonai, he's the approachable aspect of God. Not a different God. It's just a way of seeing him in the midst of his infiniteness in ways that you can relate to. And so while we cry out to Yahweh, we can actually say, Adonai, hear my voice. That intimacy in the relationship. Hear me, listen. Sometimes we have conversations with people and we know that they're not really listening and it crushes us. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Um, It's a poetic repetition that we see right here. Hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive. And remember, once again, Hebrew literature, whenever something is repeated twice, what's it mean? It's important. Take heed. Listen again. And his cry for despair, 
to God. It's important to him. But I do like very clearly what he says here. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Hear my voice. Do we notice here that the psalmist, when he's crying out to God, isn't asking God to answer their prayers in the sense of, I want this. What's he asking God to do? To listen, just to hear. And this is where the sign of maturity and faith comes to, is because we understand that we don't necessarily always ask for the right thing. And we must understand that if we're coming to the God of the universe, the infinite holy one, that if we're going to ask, who knows best? Just like the old TV show, right? Father knows best. And so in essence, we can let him know, as scripture says, what we want. But the reality of it is, is that when we ask, we want to ask knowing that, God, this is what I think I want. This is what I see and what I'd like to see happen. But in reality, you're God of the universe. You see all the angles that I don't see. So i letting you know that I've got an issue. I think this is the best way to solve it, but I'm submitting to your will. Not my will, your be done. How many of us like that aspect of prayer? Because we tend to give him the solution that makes it the easiest on us. But making things the easiest on us is often not what God has in mind for being best. Listen to what Spurgeon had to say about this. It is better our prayer to be heard than answered. If the Lord were to make an absolute promise to answer all our requests, it might be rather a curse than a blessing. That's some ancient wisdom right there, beloved, because there's a lot that's being done within the modern church around the world that tells people that, hey, if you're a follower in Christ, you can have anything you want. You just have to ask for it in his name. And in essence, they make God no longer the God who sits on the throne of the universe as the holy, holy, holy one, and they make him out to be the genie of the lamp from Aladdin. God is not the genie of the lamp, beloved. And if we have that aspect, any iota of it, within our understanding of God, we're not seeing him for who he really is, and we need to repent of that in sackcloth and ashes, ask for his forgiveness, and then move on to seeing who he really is. Jesus told us that in this world we will have trouble. It's a given. But he's overcome the world. Therefore, take heart and follow him. And when we find ourselves in places to where it's heavy, what do we need to do? Cry out to the Holy One. Yes, according to the New Testament, we understand that we let our requests be made known with thanksgiving, but the fact of the matter, even with that, is those requests need to be submitted to the Lordship of Christ and say, hey, God, I, this is what I think, but whatever is best, that's what I want. Whatever you think is best. Because we come to verse three and realize this, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? This Lord, once again, YHWH. And when we see here that he's asking if this, the God of the universe, would actually mark, would he actually take account of, retain in remembrance, in order to punish. This is extremely important for us to understand here. Because it says here, if you should mark iniquities, and you can read some very knowledgeable people who've written some great commentaries on scripture who would basically try to tell us that God does not have an accounting of all that has been done and said in the world. And I said, well, that goes directly against what other parts of scripture says. <laughs> we do know that he actually does have an accounting and other, and I'll show you a couple verses in that in a little bit. But what this is actually referring to is that for the believer, God does not mark our iniquity so that he can punish us. And this even goes back to the children of Israel of understanding that, hey, if you're in a right relationship with Yahweh, guess what? He's not keeping track of all that you're doing to punish you. Is everything being tracked? Absolutely. Because he's the infinite God who can't be overwhelmed. He doesn't have only a two terabyte memory storage, right? And I don't know about many of us 
who are old enough to remember when we got something that had 16 gigabytes and we thought, oh my gosh, this has so much memory. Wow, it's not eight anymore. I've doubled my memory capacity in my electronic device up to 16 gigabytes. Wow. Yeah, oh yeah. And then the 30 was yours, right? It's just, this is the God whom we serve and he's not keeping track of those things to punish the faithful. But guess what? Those things will be taken care of because they're iniquities. And what are iniquities? Perversity, moral evil, fault, mischief, sin. Yes. Those things are being tracked. Why? Because a holy and righteous God, when he pronounces judgment at the day of judgment on those who have not bowed the knee to Christ, that's what will judge them. We'll see that right here. Does God keep a record? Look at this. Revelation 20 up on the board. Verse 11, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from those who faced the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it and all death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. What's in those books, beloved? The things that they've done and said that basically bring judgment upon them. So we know clearly from Scripture that they're there. But for those who are in Christ, your name's in the book of life. And guess what? <laughs> You don't have this. We don't have the same judgment that they do. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 12, but I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. What's that mean? <laughs> Our words are actually being taken down in the heavenly realm for what we say. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. And this, beloved, is biblical justice that nobody's going to be condemned for something they did not do or did not say. I don't know about you, uh, for the last three years, uh, since the president has come in, I've been looking at a lot of these cases of people that he's giving amnesty to or whatever the right term is, um, people who have been sentenced and they're in prison, and a lot of the things I've looked at and read, and you look and go, wow, either that was harsh or, wait a minute, I don't think they did this. And sure enough, there's somebody now who's coming as an advocate for them to say you, though you were pronounced guilty, were not. Uh, when it comes to the final judgment, there won't be any mistakes made by God. Absolutely none. Absolutely zero. And that's justice. Therefore, since God is a God of justice, Matthew 10, 28, Jesus reminded us, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Yahweh is a righteous judge. And when that judgment comes, it is going to happen. Therefore, I don't care how many people try to write off the fact that there's no sin and there is no God. They can sing that until they're blue in the face. Guess what? There's going to come a day, unfortunately, for those that have tried to go that way. And all that way basically is, is like a little child doing this, what? I can't hear you. You know? Like you can't, I can't hear you. It doesn't change the fact of what I'm speaking is the truth. And that we need to understand. Now, that's all based upon looking at the fact if the Lord should mark iniquities, oh Lord, who could stand? The second part of the verse there. This Lord now, Adonai. If the supreme judge of the universe should mark iniquities. Now I turn my plea and my petition intimately to, Lord, who could stand? And this brings us from justice to mercy. And this, beloved, is the beauty of the gospel, right? Mercy. Psalm 32, 2. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. See, even though there will be an accounting of our iniquities, the fact of the matter is that when we come to faith in Christ, guess what happens to what's written in those books of our iniquities? Scripture calls it, it's being blotted out. 
that under our names in those books of remembrance of all that we've done, that your name may be there and there may be a whole lot that was written after your name like mine. But when it comes to that day and those books are open, you know what comes after my name? A whole lot of red. A whole lot of blood of Jesus just wiping out all of those iniquities. And that's what it is for you too if you're a believer in Jesus. I don't know about you. Does that sound like good news? After going through the buffet of sin of life, knowing that when you come to the end with your tray all filled up and it's time to pay, and they say, well, we don't accept anything that you've got. Oh, but on your account here, it says that you've believed in Christ. Look at your account is clean, blotted out by the blood of Jesus. Is that good news or what? Romans 4, 7 to 8 says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Oh, how happy are the men and women. And please remember that when you're reading in Scripture, when you see men, it's not that God does not love women. On this, the International Day of Women, please understand that that is a general term for mankind, which includes men and women women, okay? It's not a sexist remark here in any of these things. It's the loving God speaking to all of mankind that, oh, how happy you are when you realize that your sins have been covered and the Lord will not impute sin. Having wiped out their handwriting of requirements that was against us. We see this in the book of Acts. Repent, therefore, Acts chapter three, if you remember when we went through this together, Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And what a beautiful picture, right, for those books in Revelation 20 to have our names there with all of the iniquities listed, but to know that faith in Christ brings the spiritual liquid paper to cover all of that stuff and the beauty of what Christ did at the cross for us. It's blotted out. Verse four, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. There's forgiveness with you. This picture that I chose for this. Can you tell what that is? This is a man in a hospital bed with his friend. This over here is not a pillow. That's a tumor. That word forgiveness in the Hebrew literally means a surgical cutting away. Like this man's tumor, that's what our sin looks like in the spiritual realm. And for most of us, that's actually a small tumor in the spiritual realm if you're looking at sin. This is what the glorious gospel does for us. It takes that which is going to kill us and surgically removes it. That's what forgiveness is. Selika. Everybody say that. Selika. Yeah, well, you remember that. I doubt it. But that's your Hebrew word for the day. Selika. That's what forgiveness is. Pardon. And when you hear the word pardon, I beg your pardon. I never promise you. No, you're probably not thinking that. But when we hear that word pardon, what do we tend to think of? It's the word I couldn't think of earlier. When somebody who's guilty, right? <laughs> When somebody was guilty, all of a sudden, when somebody says, you know, we're going to pardon you. Meaning that you were actually deserving of justice. But we're going to give you mercy. That's what pardon is. Uh, There's a lady that I work with in my day job um, who is a new believer in Christ. Um, And she started working for us when she was a Muslim from Iraq. And it was one of those things that we needed somebody who spoke fluent Arabic. Kind of, kind of hard to find Christians that speak fluent Arabic, right? And so we happened to be introduced to this lady. Uh, we knew from the job that she was working at before. She's very, very uh, respectable, extremely uh, trustworthy and everything. And so she needed a job and we needed somebody to do some interpretation stuff for us. And so she started working with us. Well, she came to Christ just uh, two months ago And you know what it was that brought her to Christ? The fact that the God of Christianity would forgive her of her sins. 
See, she came from a background to where she knew she was a sinner. But there was absolutely no hope in Islam for the forgiveness of sins. Zero. Absolutely none. And so if you think about that, um, they're probably the uh, number one number of people on the planet as far as what people believe religiously. Can you imagine that the third to one half of the people on the planet who believe that as the true system of spirituality have absolutely no hope for salvation? Four years ago, when I first met uh, the Islamic leader who trained al-Baghdadi and all of the senior leadership of ISIS at the university level, please understand, this man told us directly that those guys needed to be killed. They went off the farm, was the term that it was, uh, he used. It was literally interpreted by our interpreters that those guys went off the farm. In other words, what I taught them, they've totally rejected, and what they believe now is an aberration to him. And he said, it's blasphemous. But interesting, in that first meeting, Victor pointed to me and kind of shared my story with the adoption of the kids. And he's listening through the interpreter, and he turns and looks at me. So here I am, and, and he's a super sweet, big old smile, looking like, mm, like a, a Papa Smurf. It's kind of what he looked like. And he looked at me after hearing the fact that we had adopted 20 children. He said, look at me, he says, you, Muhammad, Jesus, you. So we're sitting there waiting to giggle with him, waiting for the, him to laugh. He never laughed. And from that point forward, he referred to me as Victor's prophet. And there was a time when over dinner, after just being with him for about 48 hours almost straight, after going to a mosque with him, he said, have you guys ever been to a mosque? No. Would you like to go? Victor goes, yes. All of our securities are going, no. <laughs> Ixnay on the mosque, no, no. And so all these special forces guys, they go with us to a mosque. And one of the guys actually is triggered while we're there because he says, the last time I was in a place like this, I was throwing grenades and shooting a lot of bad guys. And he said, the look, the colors, the smells, it's all the same. But this man was sitting across the table from us at a dinner. And Victor said, so when you die, sir, will you go to heaven? He, and he's, you know what his response was? Inshallah. It's Arabic for God willing, meaning it's up to God. And then he turns right away and points at me, but he's going. Well, here's the sadness in all of this, right? By my works, he sees me justified. He has no idea about the list of iniquities under Chaz Yandel written in history. He's just looking at one aspect of my life that I've done, and he's saying it's obvious that God will let you in. And we're looking at him going, oh, sir, you don't seem to understand this, do you? If we look at what we've done that's good, guess what? Nobody gets in to heaven. Nobody by what we've done. Nobody. doesn't care if he adopted 2,000 kids. It doesn't matter. We need a savior to take the price for the sin. And we're here to tell you that there's forgiveness in the king of the universe. This beloved, this silly cow, that pardon of cutting off that sin which is killing us. Interesting in that there's only two other places in Scripture that you see this specific word. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader re to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Nehemiah understood his God, didn't he? He understood his God. Listen to Daniel in chapter 9. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Beloved, just like that lady that was a Muslim before who couldn't find forgiveness, when she found out that there was actually a God who would forgive her and that she wouldn't have to walk on broken glass, on her knees, up 
and you know, up and up both ways, up and down the mountain to get to a God and hope that he would forgive her. When she found out that Jesus went to the cross to pay for her sins, I don't know about you, it's one of the most amazing things to be around young believers and especially people who came out of a non-Christian background who just now, all this girl wants to do is tell all of all her family members and friends and all the people she went to college with back there that there's hope in Jesus. And there isn't any hope in Allah because he's capricious. Beautiful stuff, yeah? This is the beauty of the gospel of knowing that there's forgiveness with you, with God, with God and God alone. And therefore, that you may be feared. Now, does the fact that God is ready and willing to forgive anybody of their sins from the past that will come and believe in him make you think that that's the same type of response now that would pr- produce you, oh, 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 oh gosh, I'm so afraid of this God, right? No, it's so that you would be what? So that God would be reverenced, that he'd be loved, that he'd be respected, that he'd be honored, that all of those other things that are part of fear get perfectly cast out because of the perfect love of Jesus, right? That's the way that this works, that you may be reverenced, that you may be loved, that you may be feared. Therefore, verse five, I will wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. And if somebody this morning is saddened because we didn't sing the Jeremy Camp song for I Wait for the Lord, I'm sorry. The movie's coming out this week. Go see the movie. Uh, Great story coming out on Friday, yeah. Um, Because God is the God who will forgive sin. And when we have those sins forgiven because we've believed in what he did through his son Jesus on the cross, then our response hopefully is to reverently love him and guess what part of that is? Waiting on him, waiting for the Lord, waiting on Yahweh here. That I've had my faith-filled cry to God for the deliverance of my soul answered, therefore I'm gonna trust now and I'm gonna wait. How many of us like to wait Right? Nobody? No waiters in the crowd? No waitresses? Yeah, right, right. Here's Veruca right here from, Char- from Willy Wonka. If you didn't hear it, it goes, we want it now. Daddy, I want an Oompa Loompa now, right? All right, Veruca darling, you know, Wonka, how much for, right? And they're not for sale. Well, everything's going to price. This is the reality of this world and the society that we live in now. We don't like to wait. None of us do. Some of us may be better at it than others, but the fact of the matter is we've been trained to think that what we want, we should get it before we want it. Not even just when we want it, we should have got it before we want it. And we've been around people, I mean, it, all you have to do is go to and stand in line at some place that has a line. I guarantee you, you're gonna hear some huffing, <sighs> the big deep breath ones, <sighs> You're going to see some people, arms crossed over. You're going to see some, maybe hear some foot stamping, like, or you're going to hear the foot tapping. And people think that, oh, since I ordered this, it should already be ready. But I don't want it, having been sat under a heat lamp for minutes, but I do want it prepared and made right away right now, right? Interesting how we are as people. But if we will come and see God for who he is, we'll be willing to wait for him to answer those prayers that we've asked, knowing that he heard me. He heard. And he's not necessarily doing it the way that I asked for, so therefore, what's the logical and natural deduction on our part? He's working out something else that's a whole lot better for me. That's the way it should go, right? But so often, which way do we go? I must have sinned. I must have done something wrong. And then you start confessing for all the things that you did wrong and then you start making things up that you didn't even do wrong, thinking that you might have done them wrong, trying to get God to be the genie of the lamp, right? No, we wait for the Lord. And even to the understanding of that, the depth of my soul, the depth of who I am and my innermost being, I'm gonna wait. I will wait upon you, Lord. Because in your word, I do hope. What word? The fact of the matter that he's a forgiving God. And that if he's a forgiving and merciful God who now says, hey, you can call me daddy. 
You can call me Abba. Even though I am the supreme potentate of the universe, no beginning and no end, even though I am infinite and infinitely holy, when you believe what I did through my son on the cross, you know what you can call me now? Daddy. I don't know about you, that's amazing. And we stand upon his word and we wait with hope in him and in his word because if the God of the universe is willing to forgive us, don't you think he's willing to actually give us good things like Jesus said he would? But we have to believe that sometimes what we think is good isn't necessarily good in his eyes. So we wait. Verse six, my soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. My soul waits for the Lord. The Lord here, once again, Adonai, that intimate relationship with God. And the depth of my innermost being is waiting for the morning. Any of you besides Jenica work night shifts before? Yeah. Night shifts is a bizarre thing in the sense of, right? Because sometimes, I don't know about you, I'm the type of person, I need darkness to sleep. My wife can sleep with all the lights on and it blows me away because of the lights on, even the littlest bit, I'm awake. And even like in the morning after it's been dark, if a sliver of light like hits me in my facial area, that eye's gonna go up (laughs) and I wanna see the sliver of light coming through and I'm not going to be happy because I need darkness in there. This concept of watching for the morning. There were people here whose specific job was to make sure everybody else in the community was safe by staying up all night. They usually were in towers. They were usually part of the military. And that what they were doing is that they were waiting for the sun to come up because once the sun came up, chances are the invading army wasn't going to come after them because it was now daytime and we can now see. But in the nighttime, this guy's whole job and all of them who were on the parapets in those towers was to strain and look real hard for anything that might give them a clue that the enemies were coming. The psalmist, when he writes here, says, hey, I wait for the Lord, Adonai, the intimate one, more than those who are watching for the morning. Because those people who are working through the night, watching for the enemies coming in, when the sunrise would come up, and the light would be there, you know what they would do? Ah, We didn't get attacked. (laughs) Because usually, you know who got attacked first? Those guys in the towers. (laughs) Somebody with a bow and arrow, would, or somebody would be climbing up to sneak up there to take them out, because that was their whole job, was to watch and then to warn once they saw. And so this guy's saying, hey, I watch for God more than those guys watch for the morning. And that's a challenge to us today, isn't it? Do we look for God in every hour of the day with great expectation and great hope and great longing like the watchman would look for the morning? And so he turns from himself individually and then says, oh Israel, now looking at the nation, my family, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy and with him is abundant redemption. O Israel, hope in Yahweh, the eternal one who sits on the throne. Look to him, and as a nation, look to him. Why? Because for with the Lord there is mercy. Now, this word, mercy, is my favorite Old Testament word. Anybody remember? Hesed. Strong's number 2617. This is intentional acts of kindness done to somebody who's a complete stranger being treated as if they were a family member. For with the Lord, there is mercy. With the Yahweh, there is this chesed. And there is no greater example of chesed than the second part of the word, the verse, with him is abundant redemption. Everybody say abundant redemption. Everybody say plenteous deliverance. Yeah, that's funny. When you look up the definitions of words and it doesn't make things easier, it makes it harder. But that's abundant redemption means that there's a whole lot of forgiveness within God. How much forgiveness? An infinite amount. Yeah, a whole lot, an infinite amount. 
Isaiah spoke of this under the unction of the Spirit. Isaiah 55, 7. Let, it, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. He's not just going to pardon. He's going to abundantly pardon. And I don't know where you're at this morning whether you're here, whether you're listening on the internet, I don't know where you're at spiritually, but if you feel like, like something that you've done or the accumulation of what you've done is greater than the mercy of God, I'm here to tell you, Scripture says absolutely not. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell because God will abundantly pardon anyone who will come to that cross with Jesus' arms stretched wide open saying, come unto me, all ye that labor. There's forgiveness in God. The picture of Christ on the cross, the picture of the cross itself is a love letter from God throughout eternity telling mankind there's forgiveness here. Arms wide open. In no wise will he cast out anybody who comes in faith saying, I need a savior. And if you don't believe that for yourself, look at the thief on the cross. When you look at all of the Gospels, it's harmonized to see that when he's first up on the cross, he's mocking Christ, just like both of the guys are mocking Christ from there. But we see that Jesus' response and what Jesus did on that cross during that time helped that guy to realize, oh my gosh, you really are who you've said you are. And with a simple act of faith, he says, Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And what's Jesus' response? Too late, dude. Too late, man. You should have repented long ago. I'm going to list off all the people that I've sent your way. Is that what Jesus does to the guy? No. What's he tell him? I tell you the truth. This day, you will be with me in paradise. Is that not a greatest example of abundant redemption that you see there, right? Isn't that plenteous deliverance right there? It is, and this is what God desires to do for those who will take that step of faith. And we close here in verse eight. He shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Sometimes when you read your Bible, and especially when you read the Old Testament, you think to yourself, well, why did God choose Israel? Because they weren't necessarily the greatest at following him, were they? Matter of fact, Some would say, I think God pretty much, if he would have chosen any other people group on the planet, probably would have did a little better. The fact of the matter is, guess what? Humanity. They were the perfect example of people that were going to blow it. And even though they blew it, what does the God of Scripture and the God of the universe do? He remains faithful. He remains remains true to his word. He remains one who is ready to forgive. And so therefore, beloved, take great, great, great consolation this morning in knowing that faith in Christ will guarantee you redemption from all our iniquities. All. What's that word in the Greek mean, beloved? Thank you. And what's that word mean in Hebrew, Eric? (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Oh, and I don't know about you, that sure makes me smile, right? The fact that God is willing to do that. And listen to this, and this is where we close. In Colossians chapter two. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. Beloved, this is why the cross is such a great picture for those who are being saved, but we understand for those who are perishing, it's foolishness. So you're telling me that the God of the universe would actually send his only son to the cross to take a horrific beating from sinful people, and you're telling me if I will believe that he did that for me, I can have my sins redeemed? They can be blotted away, washed away? Yeah, I know, 
sounds like foolishness. God even said people were going to say it was going to sound like foolishness. But to those who've already experienced it, what is it? It's the power of God unto salvation. And it's something that blows our mind every time we take a moment to think about it because it makes absolutely no sense why anybody, let alone the God of the universe, who's never had sin would do that on our behalf, right? And you think of the things that maybe in this life that somebody has done for us that to us was so over the top in love and sacrifice. It's nothing compared to what Christ did. But we get opportunities every day to do these little things that say, well, we do this because Jesus did this for us. So for me to do this for you, it's an honor and it's a blessing. And I just do it because I want you to know that there's hope in God and that that God loves you. So Father, thank you this morning. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you have gone to great extent to show us that you love us unconditionally. And you present the gospel through the picture of the cross to us this morning, saying, my child, where are you at? If you were once with me and you need to come home, the arms are wide open of Christ, ready to receive. If you've never, ever come to me, the arms of Christ are wide open to receive. And I know you may have a million questions, but I'm an infinite God and we've got time to work all those out. But the one question that has to be answered is, do you believe? Do you believe that I'm a God who desires to forgive so much that I would go to such great extents and pay the price for your sin that only I could pay? regardless of where you're at right now, if you're in this building, if you're uh, listening through the internet or whatever, you can have salvation right now if you will come to Christ and say, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. It's unbelievable, but I believe with what little faith that I have. And just like uh, the man recorded in the New Testament, I believe, but help my unbelief. He's willing to take us right where we're at, but he loves us so much, he won't leave us there. And so God, move by your spirit among the people who have heard today and may they respond with faith and experience salvation. No special words, no magic formula, but simply acknowledging your sin and understanding and acknowledging the fact that Jesus went to the cross to pay for it and that you believe will begin that process of salvation and then through sanctification. Lord, we're thankful for all that you're doing. We're thankful as we respond now to what you've spoken through your word. Continue by your spirit to meet us where we're at. Continue by your spirit to lead us and guide us into the truth that we need and give us that unction of faith if we need to take that step of faith forward today. Whether it's in a step of faith forward to return or whether it's a step of faith to come for the very first time. Your love, Lord, is so amazing. Thank you for your love for us.